Welcome to another Infographic Instant conference presentation. In this conference, we'll be looking at Hong Kong's role in improving corporate governance in China, lessons from the Panama Papers. Before we begin, I should note that the material in this presentation represents only my own views, and nothing in this presentation may be attributed to my co-authors or any institutions that we are affiliated with. What is the current state of China's corporate governance? As we see from this first graphic, Chinese corporate governance ranks relatively badly vis-a-vis -vis other jurisdictions. So looking at the corporate governance indicators, which amalgamate several different types of indicators, we see that China ranks lower than Taiwan, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And interestingly enough, China could well learn from Hong Kong, as Hong Kong seems to represent the leader amongst regional economies in corporate governance. In this next infographic, we see that China's corporate governance only rates 37% vis-a-vis other jurisdictions. In this infographic, we break up these corporate governance scores into their components. And you can see the original paper for more definition on each of these components. The graphic shows the lowest score in each category, the average score, and the highest score in each category. In that way, we can look at the relative dispersion among Chinese companies in terms of each of these corporate governance dimensions. China's corporate governance in the area of fairness, transparency, surprisingly enough, and supervisors rate relatively high, particularly for those highest scoring companies. However, when we look at the corporate governance scores overall, we see that China's corporate governance across these dimensions comes in at a relatively low 37%. Not only are corporate governance scores relatively low in China, but we see that they're also out of control in the statistical sense of the word. As you recall from other infographic presentations, we describe a process as out of control when any indicator or score exhibits a high amount of variability. That variability prevents policymakers from adopting stable rules that can address those problems. Corporate governance scores for Chinese companies have varied significantly from 2008 to 2012. They also vary quite significantly between the lowest scoring companies and the highest scoring companies. However, these perspectives hide a relatively more complex phenomenon in the mainland's corporate governance. Namely, corporate governance practices affect large Chinese companies differently than small Chinese companies. In this infographic, we see the effect of corporate governance on the particular tax payment behavior of various Chinese companies. And we see that for large Chinese companies, better corporate governance scores tend to correlate with more tax cheating, implying that corporate governance actually helps these companies figure out ways of cheating on their taxes. Whereas in for small companies, good corporate governance practices encourage them to pay their taxes. So looking at the broader pattern, we see that the relationship between corporate governance and other behaviors like tax avoidance, they're nonlinear. They exhibit this kind of hill shape. We see that corporate governance rules can either serve the company that adopts them, or they can help serve the private interests of directors and managers who run those companies. Thus, looking at a mainland company and seeing that they rate highly in terms of corporate governance does not necessarily tell us whether their practices are investor-friendly or worker-friendly. Thus, from a policy perspective, the best amount of corporate governance reform is that reform which falls into the Goldilocks level 
or a corporate governance reform that's neither too much so as to encourage self-seeking, but not too little, such as to hinder a company's efforts at improving its behavior vis-a-vis -vis other institutions, workers, and other stakeholders. Another way we know that mainland corporate governance rates relatively lowly is by looking at actual market data. Economists often say that prices don't lie. Stock market crashes also do not lie. The infographic that we see here shows the average time that mainland companies listed in the U.S. took to delist. These companies, many of which listed or merged, engaged in reverse mergers around 2004, ended up delisting because of a scandal roughly during the global financial crisis. Thus, we know that corporate governance in these companies could not withstand the economic crisis and that the market ended up revealing these bad corporate governance practices. Furthermore, we see based on the correlation of share prices and lawsuits, we see that poor corporate governance ends up costing these mainland companies a lot of time and a lot of money. Even if mainland companies benefit in the short term from poor corporate governance practices, they do not benefit in the long term. The infographic we're looking at now looks at the effect on market value relative to the book value of assets of these mainland companies listed on various exchanges. So as mainland companies list on the NASDAQ, we see their market value relative to their book value or relative to the value of what they paid for particular assets that value increased by more than a factor of two when they adopted the NASDAQ's corporate governance regulations. These market valuations increased slightly over two for listing on the American Stock Exchange and again adopting its corporate governance practices. Interestingly enough, when mainland companies delisted from a U.S. exchange and then listed in Hong Kong, they saw a market valuation decline, strongly suggesting that corporate governance regulations, among others, are less coveted in Hong Kong than in the U.S. And indeed, many analysts have suggested that these market valuations show why Hong Kong corporate governance regulations do not serve companies as well as they do in the U.S. The biggest decline, though, comes from Taiwanese corporate governance regulations, and we see that market valuations decline roughly by a factor of two as mainland companies move their listings from the U.S. to Taiwan. So we can clearly see in the data that listing on various exchanges and adopting their corporate governance rules certainly has strong effects on these mainland companies' valuations. The infographic in front of us shows the estimated returns from the Sarbanes-Oxley Act as a proxy for looking at the broader corporate governance regulations affecting U.S. listed companies. Each of these bars show the effect of Sarbanes-Oxley on value companies versus growth companies, small companies versus large they show the effects of this regulation on risk premia and on excess returns. And we see that Sarbanes-Oxley and these stricter corporate governance rules did indeed cause excess returns for all listed companies in the U.S. However, for most of these categories, the returns of foreign companies derive the greatest benefit from these stricter corporate governance regulations. So the message from all of these infographics is that Chinese companies should want to reform their corporate governance, not because they want to do the right thing, but because they want to obtain the market benefits that go along with better corporate governance. Indeed, several other infographics illustrate the case for reform. The infographic we see here shows that poor investment decisions go hand in hand with poor disclosure and corporate governance practices in China. So 
looking at the investment inefficiency or a econometric measure of the extent to which mainland companies are misallocating investment resources, we see that disclosure practices have very little effect on either over or underinvestment, yet they interact very strongly with corporate governance practices. And indeed, we see that corporate governance practices themselves have strong effects on investment misallocation, particularly in causing mainland companies to underinvest. Indeed, for mainland companies with relatively high corporate governance scores, we see that these effects are mitigated. However, even these well-ranking corporate governance companies exhibit some underinvestment. Again, we observe the benefits of corporate governance reform, particularly in the area of disclosures, as mainland companies which disclose more, unsurprisingly, statistically significantly end up getting more external finance and attracting very slight increases in return on assets. Again, looking at this trade-off between self-serving and serving the broader interests of the corporation, we see that certain corporate governance arrangements probably serve the corporate interests more than others. One way of illustrating this is to look at the effect of different corporate governance rules and practices on auditor choice. The idea in this study is that mainland companies with poor corporate governance practices would want to choose a lower or worse auditor such that poor corporate governance practices would slide along. We see that companies choose better auditors as the number of supervisors on their supervisory board increase, unremarkably as the company's assets, sales, and even debt increase, and unsurprisingly also, we see that companies with a very large shareholder relative to others end up choosing worse auditors, suggesting some amount of self-serving by these large shareholders. Again, to hammer in this message of the relationship between market returns and corporate governance, we see the change in Tobin's Q versus changes in corporate governance index for these mainland companies. And indeed, we observe in this cloud of dots a slightly positive relationship between market valuations as a percent of book value and changes in these companies' corporate governance index scores. The cloud-like configuration of these data might lead us to question this relationship, but as we will demonstrate in other infographics, a large host of data helps to support this conclusion. So what overall benefit would better corporate governance give to mainland companies? In this infographic, we step back and we ask, well, if all mainland companies ratcheted up their corporate governance scores from the lowest to the highest on a five-point scale in the case of this infographic, what would be the increase in market valuation for these companies? And we calculate in terms of the Tobin's Q of these companies and their current market valuations that better corporate governance rules for these firms would add roughly 2.7 trillion extra US dollars to their market capitalization. We'll show later that the likely increase is much less than this best case scenario, but nevertheless, we are dealing with a very large amount of money. So the overall conclusion from all these infographics is that better corporate governance practices on the mainland end up delivering more alpha or excess profits to investors and end up lowering risks. A more surprising conclusion from this research, though, shows that Chinese and Hong Kong companies are linked through a network or a system that Hong Kong corporate governance practices affect Chinese companies as much as Chinese corporate governance practices affect Hong Kong companies. This infographic shows the evolution of Mossack Fonseca data. We see that there are ways of popular international financial centers over time. So in the early 90s, mainland and Hong Kong companies preferred using Panama and later Bahamas-based incorporators 
Whereas in, in the beginning of the 2000s, they preferred the British Virgin Islands and to some extent Hong Kong itself. By the next decade, 2012, we see that a lot of this business shifted to the seashells and particularly British Anguilla. So if these waves appeared predominantly for Hong Kong-based clients of offshore corporate incorporators, we see that mainland customers mostly came online after the 2000s and focused their demand around the BVI and to a lesser extent Samoa and the seashells. The results of this evolution have ended up with a scattering of offshore company clients across China and particularly along the coast. This infographic shows the number of clients reported by Mossack Fonseca for its services as reported by the database put online by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And what we see here is that demand for these offshores has been relatively robust, unsurprisingly, around some of the larger commercial and metropolitan areas. However, we see that there is no necessary one place in China where demand for offshore structures focuses, suggesting that offshore vehicles have become an entrenched business practice and have become part and parcel of corporate governance practices on the mainland. Now, what is the relationship between the quality of corporate governance in Hong Kong and mainland companies versus the propensity of these companies to set up offshore structures. This infographic shows the change in offshore accounts for the change in corporate governance for China and Hong Kong. So a positive correlation between offshore incorporations and corporate governance scores would suggest that corporate governance regulations aren't working as good corporate governance practices wouldn't and shouldn't be expected to go along with more offshore companies, which are almost always untrue transparent entities and at their worst used to evade obligations to the tax authority, creditors, investors, and others. Whereas in a negative correlation between corporate governance scores and offshore incorporations might suggest that these better corporate governance practices are working. And what we see across time is that during and after the global financial crisis, Hong Kong companies ended up benefiting from better corporate governance practices to the extent that they relied less on offshore incorporations. Whereas in by the turn of the decade, both Chinese and Hong Kong companies ended up improving corporate governance practices as well as increasing the extent to which they set up offshore entities. Thus, the increase in the use of offshore entities, along with measures which we would typically associate with better corporate governance practices, is relatively worrying. More worrying, however, is the fact that maybe better corporate governance rules in Hong Kong have ended up driving out good companies to the mainland or encouraging the transfer of business from Hong Kong to the mainland where corporate governance regulations are more lax. The infographic in front of us now shows the annual change in Mossack Fonseca offerings of company openings, namely how many companies that Mossfon opened for Chinese and Hong Kong clients. And what we see is that before the turn of this decade, that Chinese demand for offshore companies followed or coincided with Hong Kong demand for offshore entities. However, by 2002 onward, we see a significant divergence in demand for offshore entities between Chinese companies and Hong Kong companies. This date is noteworthy because Hong Kong not only had adopted stronger corporate governance rules, but also had been working on significant changes to its money laundering rules.
and thus one interpretation of these data might point to a significant drop in demand from Hong Kong companies and a significant rise in demand from Chinese companies and more worryingly that demand from Hong Kong is actually shifting onto the mainland such that former mainland companies that would have incorporated offshores in Hong Kong ended up taking this demand for offshores onto the mainland. Yet, as we show in our paper, Hong Kong partially causes the mainland's bad corporate governance practices, and we see the spillover of these poor corporate governance practices and their effects in a significant amount of data in this paper. Other data point to the network or systemic nature of corporate governance relations between China and Hong Kong. This infographic shows the network of offshore relationships between Hong Kong and China as shown in the Mossack Fonseca data. And what we see in these networks is that Hong Kong and China end up using offshore incorporation centers together much more than would be suggested if there were some random factors accounting for this demand. So in other words, if Chinese companies had used particular offshore financial incorporation centers and Hong Kong used other offshore financial incorporation centers, there would be less of a correlation unless there had been some kind of communication or some kind of cooperation between Chinese companies, Chinese incorporation agents, and their Hong Kong counterparts. And indeed, comparing these relationships with the type of networks we observe in other jurisdictions, as well as comparing these linkages to a random set of linkages, we see that these network relationships through offshore incorporation centers are indeed deliberate and cannot be explained simply by random chance. Other data point to the prima facie conclusion that Hong Kong in some way helps determine Chinese corporate governance practices. This infographic shows the change in Chinese corporate governance practices relative to the level of corporate governance index values in Hong Kong. So the way we read this infographic is that as the level of corporate governance in Hong Kong rises, corporate governance practices improve, they change over time more significantly. And indeed the relationship before controlling for outside factors, the relationship between the level of corporate governance in Hong Kong and changes or improvements in corporate governance on the mainland is relatively strong. More significantly, we worry about the way that mainland companies use offshore entities in order to engage in corporate misconduct, given the negative relationship between corporate governance index values and demand for offshore entities. This infographic shows the growth in corporate governance index values and the level of offshore incorporations on the mainland. And what we see is that for relatively low levels of corporate governance, corporate governance practices themselves improve relatively slowly over time, whereas in demand for offshore entities clips along relatively briskly. At the high end of the corporate governance scale, we see that the impetus for corporate governance reform significantly strengthens, whereas in interest in these offshore structures declines. If these relationships represent a deeper underlying structure, then these data suggest a level where corporate governance and offshore incorporations balance out each other, such that once these mainland companies reach this critical level, this takeoff level, they will reverse this cycle of relying on offshore entities and instead focus more on improving their corporate governance. Indeed, the Mossack Fonseca data show that Hong Kong as an international financial center had very significant ties to a number of offshore corporation centers. Looking more closely at the data, we see that over 270 bank addresses traced back to Hong Kong, as well as 12 offshore entities, four officers, and three bank intermediaries. 
the list that you see in front of you shows the names of some of these financial institutions named in the Panama Papers. On the finance and securities side of the market, we see that over 150 addresses of finance and securities establishments trace back to Hong Kong with a startling 441 offshore entities, 26 intermediaries and 21 officers pinned to Hong Kong. So we see that Hong Kong and China form a interconnected system of corporate practices. And so if Hong Kong corporate governance practices represent part of the problem or influence mainland corporate governance practices, then fixing Hong Kong's own corporate governance practices represents a critical first step to reforming corporate governance practices on the mainland. Now, why do mainland companies and corporate governance regulations on the mainland need a boost from outside and particularly Hong Kong? Many academics and policymakers have advocated change from the inside on the mainland. Namely, the mainland government should be responsible for improving corporate governance practices in its territory. However, as we know, there are serious data that cause us to question whether the mainland government can improve corporate governance regulations, not to mention practices, over the longer term. We see that since the adoption of China's corporate governance code, most of these dimensions of corporate governance, as we see in the infographic here, have improved. Yet we see that such improvement has not been consistent over the various dimensions of corporate governance, which we look at in our paper. So, for example, we look at several dimensions of corporate governance, and as you can see, we show those which have fallen behind in roughly the five years since the code was adopted. While mainland regulators' achievements in passing some sort of corporate governance regulations is laudable, we see that there remains much room for improvement. The next infographic will show us why. One of the reasons for this lack of improvement might trace to the relatively abstract nature of the code itself. In this infographic, we show some of the principles and some of the legal language outlined in the mainland's Code of Corporate Governance. And as we see, any court or company would have serious problems trying to define operationally many of these principles. More worryingly, roughly half of this code of corporate governance encourages companies to obey laws found in other parts of Chinese law. If the corporate governance regulations themselves do not inspire confidence, we see that the incentives for reform paint an even bleaker picture. This infographic shows the number of offshore incorporations for mainland clients vis-a-vis -vis the number of millionaires in various metropolitan areas on the mainland. And what we see is that as the number of millionaires increase in a particular city, so too do the number of offshore incorporations. Naturally, this might just be a scale effect such that bigger cities attract both more millionaires and more offshore structures. However, the lack of correlation with regard to some cities, such as Guangzhou, Hangzhou, and Shenzhen, suggest relatively robust demand for these offshore entities, and indeed that these millionaires may depend on these offshore companies in order to secure their fortune. What we don't show in this deck of infographics is the political logic of the mainland's current corporate governance arrangements. Most authors point to the social objectives that the government places on mainland companies, such that companies cannot adopt good corporate governance practices because they are responsible to the Communist Party and the government more generally for engaging in particular kinds of political or social activities. Thus, it's in the interest of both the company and the government to hide particular types of transactions from investors and other stakeholders. So if this internal logic of governance on the mainland militates for relatively poor corporate governance practices, then any impetus for reform has to come from outside this system. 
Now, what would be the benefits of such a foreign source boost for mainland corporate governance practices? This infographic shows the percent of offshore corporate vehicles associated with large-scale corruption investigations. First, we see that most of these investigations and prosecutions for corruption and other harmful corporate governance practices had to be done extraterritorially that we couldn't rely on national rules in order to catch and prosecute these malefactors. These data also show that not only were offshore corporations important, but also closely linked to various crimes and poor corporate governance practices, but so too were offshore bank accounts. Because of the offshore nature of these corporations and bank account openings, this strongly suggests that there has to be some kind of international dimension to closing the avenues available to corporate directors and managers that use these structures in order to hurt their corporations and siphon off money. The other argument for such a foreign boost comes from the infographic you see in front of you. This infographic shows China's place relative to other jurisdictions and the effect that stricter corporate governance rules might have on its companies. So for example, corporate governance rules related to accounting and related to shareholder protection, we see significant improvement in abnormal returns, especially for companies from jurisdictions with relatively poor accounting investor protection rules, as well as from those jurisdictions that have only medium rating regulations governing the protection of investors. We do see an increase in delistings of companies from these jurisdictions, and we note particularly the large effect that investor protection regulations have on these delisting trends. These data strongly suggest that the U.S. Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank rules both of which have very stringent corporate governance regulations attached to them. Both these regulations had strong market improving effects on particular types of companies and that Chinese companies in particular exhibit those traits which of the companies that most benefited from Sarbanes-Oxley and later Dodd-Frank. Before Hong Kong can motivate mainland firms to improve their corporate governance, we have to first think about cleaning up Hong Kong's corporate governance regulations themselves. This infographic shows financial secrecy in Hong Kong relative to other jurisdictions. As measured by the Tax Justice Network, we see that Switzerland represents the most opaque jurisdiction of all the territories that they surveyed. And as we see, Hong Kong represents one of the most opaque jurisdictions out of all these territories. Hong Kong scores worse than Singapore, uh, the bad parts of the USA, like Delaware, Nevada. It also scores worse than the Cayman Islands. Interestingly enough, Chinese rules and practices are much more transparent than their Hong Kong counterparts, suggesting that if Hong Kong has a lot to teach mainland companies, the mainland itself certainly has something to teach to Hong Kong in terms of promoting financial transparency. We see that this lack of transparency runs through the professional services industries in Hong Kong, as shown shown by the number of reports of suspicious transactions made by Hong Kong's law firms. What we see is that the number of these reports has improved somewhat between 2011 and 2015. However, in absolute terms, these law firms account for only 2% of all of the suspicious transaction reports filed in Hong Kong. So if Hong Kong's professional service sectors adopt more stringent rules, policing corporate governance practices, and preventing the use of offshore entities as a means of using poor corporate governance practices to siphon off resources, how much would those rules hurt our accounting firms, our law firms, and so forth? 
This infographic shows employment during the offshore and corporation sector, and we see that Hong Kong's employment ranks much lower than employment in this sector in jurisdictions like the UK and US, and gross estimated revenue derived from these incorporations comes in at levels much lower than revenues from places like the UK and US. Thus, any kind of rules curbing international incorporations from Hong Kong would have relatively little effects given the relatively small footprint of these industries in Hong Kong's overall economy. But moreover, as we show in our paper, more stringent regulations on these offshore incorporation agents and corporate secretarial firms would jeopardize at most only 1% of the market value of this sector in Hong Kong. Another infographic shows the need to clean up Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis other jurisdictions. This picture shows the result of an experiment conducted several years ago by relatively brave academics. In this experiment, they approached different offshore incorporation agents and presented them with evidence that strongly correlate with clients using offshore entities in order to launder money, conceal the proceeds of crime, or engage in other types of nefarious practices. Looking at the good side of these data, we see that Hong Kong certainly ranks much lower in terms of accepting these dodgy approaches than other jurisdictions like the UK, US, Panama. However, looking at the bad side of the picture, we see that with acceptance rates well over 50%, Hong Kong has a significant ways to go in terms of adopting rules which hinder the use of offshore entities in concealing nefarious corporate or even criminal activities. Interestingly enough, their study also found that many of the most notorious offshore incorporation centers, such as the Cayman Islands, Bahamas, and so forth, had almost no acceptance of these dodgy offerings. Thus taken together, these infographics suggest that Hong Kong can in fact contribute to improving corporate governance on the mainland. However, Hong Kong must itself improve its own corporate governance rules and practices in order to help be that shining light of good corporate governance to the mainland. How large would the benefits be of adopting corporate governance rules which encourage mainland companies to improve their corporate practices? This infographic shows the distribution of equity prices before the adoption of corporate governance reforms in Hong Kong and after. And what we see is that changes in equity prices tightened up after the adoption of these corporate governance reforms. If these trends in the data reflect corporate governance reform instead of residual effects from the global economic crisis, then these data suggest that any reforms leading to better corporate governance on the mainland would reduce risk for investors. We also find that these better corporate governance regulations would lead to a 7% growth in market valuations, as shown by this distribution of market returns. However, not all companies would benefit. Looking simply at the mass of companies, we might expect a 20% decline in market valuations, reflecting harms to these companies from their current poor corporate governance practices. However, with the adoption of better corporate governance practices, we would expect to see the average return move over time or approach these positive returns that the market would exhibit overall. This 7% growth in market valuations would translate to roughly 330 billion extra dollars in market valuation for these mainland companies. We can measure the benefits of adopting better corporate governance practices by looking at the way mainland company share prices reacted to the changes in the corporate governance code around 2011-2012. Of these mainland companies listed in Hong Kong, relative to Hong Kong companies themselves, relative to mainland companies listed on the mainland, and relative to overall market returns on the mainland itself. And using a differences and differences approach, 
which basically extracts any outside influences, such as overall changes in markets, we see that there would be a positive effect of adopting these reforms. We see that this positive effect would come from both declining risks as well as increasing returns. If these benefits come to pass, the extraterritorial application of better corporate governance regulations applied to mainland companies might well have a boomerang effect, improving corporate governance practices in Hong Kong itself. For those viewers interested in the more practical side of this research, we provide 31 recommendations for the Hong Kong government, which the Hong Kong government can adopt in order to improve corporate governance both at home as well as to extend the reach of corporate governance practices onto the mainland. Viewers interested in looking at the data and the recommendations more fully should download and read our paper available on the Social Science Research Network. This has been another Infographic Instant conference presentation with Brian Michael.